awareness about vaccines. And currently, we are particularly focusing on COVID-19, a pandemic that we are all dealing with since March 2020. Uh, quoting from uh, a spotlight series that I came across uh, from South Asia, spotlight series, uh, Dr. Priya Abraham uh, was about to catch flight on uh, January 29, uh, 29th of January, uh, that is in 2020, last year, when she received a phone call. And currently, ma'am, uh, I think we have a positive. That might... Uh, that night, she headed uh, straight to her institute to assess if a new virus had entered India, uh, Indian shores. After uh, a night full of discussions with a team of scientists, she braced herself to inform the authorities that COVID-19 found its way uh, to our country. In today's session of Gyantika, we have uh, the women scientists highlighted in this spotlight series uh, and at many other platforms, Dr. Priya Abraham, Director, uh, National Institute of Virology, Pune. Today, we will learn about variants of COVID-19 India's own co-vaccine, an indigenous vaccine yes, for which yes, NIV uh, has great contribution. So now uh, I invite uh, our chair, uh, Chair Inyas, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Sharma, to formally introduce Dr. Abraham. Chandra. Yes, uh, thank you, Upasna, and very good afternoon to all viewers. So as you know, INIAS is the only recognized Young Scientist Academy of India, which was initiated by INSA in 2015. And uh, as a uh, commitment to the to serve the society, INIAS has taken a lot of initiatives in last uh, almost two years uh, for the COVID pandemic. And uh, recently in this year, we have started a multi-pronged approach for the uh, awareness of the vaccine in the country. Uh, and as a part of this, this is a Gyantika webinar series in which we invite uh, eminent speakers to talk about the vaccine in general and also in particular for the COVID vaccine on a monthly basis. So today uh, I welcome Dr. Abraham for this Gyantika webinar series. Uh, thanks for your time and willingness to be one of the speakers, ma'am. I'm sure most of our audience already know you, uh, but I will take a few minutes to introduce you to others. Our today's speaker, Dr. Priya Abraham, currently director of ICMR, National Institute of Virology, Pune, completed her MD and PhD from Christian Medical College, Valur. She served as head of the department of CMC Valur. She has taken in-depth interest in hepatitis viruses and human papillomavirus infections, and now supervising NIV, for COVID-19 uh, research, diagnostics, vaccine research, and much more. Dr. Abraham was invited by WHO to serve as a team member in the formulation of detection and prevention of HPV and HIV infections, as well as screening of HPV infections. In 2017, she was invited to serve as a WHO consultant to Myanmar to formulate the hepatitis testing guidelines for the country. She has been part of the WHO external team to Sri Lanka for assessment of the country's national plan in HIV, AIDS, and STI in September 2017. She has served as a scientific advisory committee member to the ICMR virus unit at National Institute of Communicable and Enteric Diseases, Kolkata. She was part of the national task force to outline the molecular epidemiology of human papillomavirus infections in India. Dr. Abraham took over as director of NIV Pune in November 2019, just two months before the first coronavirus case was detected in India. And NIV, under her supervision, has been at the forefront of India's battle with the coronavirus. So without taking much more, uh, any more time, now I invite Dr. Abraham to deliver her talk. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar Sharma, the chair of INYAS, and also the organizers of this Gyantika event, Dr. Upasana Ray and Dr. Nishan Chakravarti, and all the uh, other eminent scientists and young um, aspirants in the field of science. It is really an honor to be part of this webinar series on Gyantika. And uh, uh, without uh, wasting more of your time, let me go on to share my slides with you. I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, 
So uh, I'm going to, over this talk, uh, talk a little about how we uh, touch upon uh, a few aspects uh, of our initial journey and then how we got into the making of this indigenous vaccine. And I'm going to talk very specifically about uh, Covaxin and then speak about our studies in dealing with the variants and its impact on uh, those who have received this vaccine. So um, the outline of my talk, I'll just touch upon detecting the first COVID-19 cases and establishing testing capacity. The first isolation, which was really the biggest landmark event for us, complete characterization of the virus, handing over the virus to industry, preclinical trials of, the, of this vaccine, clinical trials, which were really done by BBL and the clinical teams, but we helped them from the laboratory end for phase one, phase two as well. And at NIV, how we interrogated these variants as SARS-CoV-2 and the lessons learned. So the first cases were reported on Jan 30th of 2020 at NIV. These were the first cases of India. And we were uh, called to immediately uh, set up testing um, capacity, write out SOPs, send out reagents to initially 13 of the uh, strategically located virus reference diagnostic labs, which are part of the health uh, department of uh, uh, health research. And then we went on to providing them with positive controls and then uh, further capacity building. And today we have over 107 of these virus research diagnostic labs and 60 to 70% of government labs use this protocol as of today. And we just didn't send out uh, reagents, SOPs, positive controls, but we were a little industry of sorts. We were sending out, you can see boxes and boxes lined up with dry ice and re uh, reagents were first checked out for QC uh, and then put into these boxes. And they left uh, Pune by the late, even the last flight out or the earliest flight out of Pune. And as of today, we have sent over 57 lakh RT-PCR reactions to the length and breadth of the country. It was very important when we were equipping so many labs that we should put ourselves to scrutiny for quality. And so by volition, we took part in the WHO's external uh, assurance control program. And we've actually participated twice. This is the first time we participated. And I'm proud to say that we got a 100% score. And th uh, thereafter, and as of today, we have at least 1,300 labs approaching us for a QCQA. So leaving that, let's come to the matter uh, at hand. And it, the first um, um, uh, big milestone, as I had mentioned earlier, was the ability to set up uh, virus isolation. We were successful in isolating the virus in Vero CCL81 cells. And we um, characterized it and confirmed it by immunofluorescence, by uh, transmission electron microscope imaging, and also doing whole virus genome sequencing. And we found that our first isolates were actually belonging to the G clade as per Gisade, or as per the Pango lineage, what one would call a B.1. Uh, we further propagated the virus, selected out strains that were you know, growing well, achieving optimum virus uh, titers. And we also went on to make our first indigenous ELISA, known as the Kavach ELISA. So we had not only a repository of strains, but also a good amount of inactivated virus antigen. We tried to interrogate uh, animal studies, infant and adult mice. We were not so successful with that. But with golden seed and hamsters, yes, we could establish that uh, high virus loads were achieved both in the upper and lower respiratory tract. There was virus shedding to the nasal cavity, and these animals were mounting an immune, uh, good immune uh, response, a humoral immune response by the first week, uh, with actually uh, changes uh, uh, seen in the lungs. So that was the background. And uh, as uh, I would say, uh, we isolated, we characterized, we selected out strains. And uh, in April, we were approached, actually ICMR as well as we in uh, NIV were approached to partner with BBIL, 
uh, Bharat Biotech International Limited, uh, located in Hyderabad, to make a live inact uh, sorry uh, inactivated an inactivated whole virion vaccine. I reiterate, an inactivated whole virion vaccine uh, with them. Uh, so, um, uh, considering the need of the R and the way this pandemic was taking the world by storm, we decided to take on this challenge. We have partnered with industry and other laboratories with earlier formulations of vaccine. So, we took this on and we handed over the strain to them by end of April. They also have a BSL-3 facility, so they were able to grow up the virus, inactivate it using beta propiolactone, and they gave it back to us for further characterization and uh, uh, came back to NIV to double check whether the virus was actually inactivated and then started the preclinical studies in June to August and the first and second um, uh, uh, phases of the clinical trial we uh, embarked on with them during July and August by testing some of their samples for neutralization assays. And you know, the rest is history. The uh, history clinical trial went on and by January, they had been given emergency use authorization. And more recently, the studies, uh, the, um, the results of the phase three clinical uh, studies have become public. So as I said, when they made the inactivated virus antigen, this is an inactivated whole virion vaccine. When they inactivated the virus, they gave it back to us and we propagated to ensure that indeed the virus was inactivated. There was no CPE. We uh, uh, examined it for its antigenic content, again, ear microscopy, and also stability for a week at different temperatures. Two of the assays that were critical to our studies were the establishment of the micro-neutralization assay, which we established soon after we were able to isolate the virus. And for those of you who are not familiar with this assay, basically it involves making dilutions of patient serum, which goes like this. And then you add a fixed amount of virus to the dilutions of a uh, patient serum and incubate it. After incubation, this virus and serum mixture is added to, a cell, uh, to wells, which contain um, uh, cellular monolayer. And if there is antibody in that, uh, in that well, whatever be the dilution, the antibody neutralizes virus, therefore rendering the virus unable to cause the classical cytopathic effect in the cell. So absence of cytopathic effect suggests there is virus. Presence of cytopathic effect suggests there is, um, um, uh, sorry, absence of uh, cytopathic effect suggests there is antibody in the serum and presence of cytopathic effect suggests there is no antibody in the serum. So this is the micro-neutralization assay and Another more uh, elaborate but uh, more sensitive version of the micro-neutralization assay is known as a plaque reduction neutralization assay. These are individual wells where, again, the, uh, the dilutions of serum with pre-incubated virus is added to these wells. It's a monolayer, and there's an overlayer of a, uh, you know, a, a semi-solid medium here we use carboxymethyl cellulose, even agar can be used. And then you incubate it for a period of three days and then overlay it with a staining dye. We had used amido black here. And you can actually see the sites where virions had set up a little, um, you know, a sites of growth. And these are known as plaques. And you count the number of plaques and you're able to see at which dilution the uh, uh, a critical number of plaques are not seen. You can have a PRNT 50, a PRNT 90, and this is a le extremely laborious assay, but was very, very handy for our virus uh, vaccine related studies. Now I, I uh, emphasize on the whole virion inactivated vaccine, and you can see other candidates that uh, uh, have, uh, are of the same genre. And we also know the, um, the um, adenovirus-based vaccines, and these are examples. And we also know RNA-based, mRNA-based vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna. 
And if you look at this, um, you know, array of different vaccine formulations, well, live attenuate, uh, sorry, killed vaccine, whole virion inactivated vaccine belongs to this, okay? Live attenuated, I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about co-vaccine, which is a whole virion inactivated vaccine. So uh, what was the adjuvant we used for this vaccine? Uh, it contained algel, which is actually aluminum hydroxide, a well-known uh, adjuvant that stimulates the Th2 response, a humoral immunity is enhanced, but uh, uh, deliberately, an additional adjuvant was added, which was imidazoquinoline, which is a TL, uh, TLR78 agonist, and therefore promotes a very good Th1 response. So there's not only antibody-mediated response, but cell-mediated immune response that is triggered when you have this combo adjuvant of algel and uh, uh, imidazoquinoline. So the start studies, these were primarily done at Bharat Biotech, where they looked at um, uh, rats, mice, and rabbits, and they were able, they used the three formulations, actually four formulations. The first formulation comprising phosphate buffered saline, and then they also used um, the six microgram of this inactivated virus formulation, plus aluminum hydroxide alone, three micrograms of the vaccine formulation with aluminum hydroxide plus amidazoquinoline, six micrograms, double the amount of virus antigen and this combo adjuvant, which is algel plus amidazoquinoline. And they um, uh, followed up these animals after uh, immunization and they could see there was a good uh, neutralizing antibody response as well as a cell-mediated immune response as you can see here, particularly with the six microgram uh, uh, antigen, as well as the combo adjuvant, which they call algel two, algel one being just aluminum hydroxide. So we went on to do uh, preclinical studies in Syrian hamsters in NIV. And uh, the hamsters, we uh, used nine hamsters in four groups. The four groups consisted those who got the uh, phosphate buffered saline. Group two, also known as the group that got just six micrograms of antigen and aluminum hydroxide or algel one. Group three, which had three micrograms of the anti uh, virus antigen um, and um, uh, uh, algel two, which is aluminum hydroxide plus imidazoquinoline and uh, six micrograms doubling up here with the combo adjuvant, as you can see here. The immunization schedule was day 0, 14, and 35. And on the 50th day, uh, these hamsters, nine uh, animals in each of the four groups, were challenged with virus intranasally. Of course, during the immunization phase, blood draw was taken. But post-immunization, Animals were, uh, three, uh, three animals of this group of nine were sacrificed each on day three, day seven, and day 15 post uh, challenge. And not only blood samples, but nasal, nasal turbinate, throat, throat wash, other respiratory specimens, including uh, lung and other uh, organ specimens were harvested from the uh, sacrificed animals. The strain that we had used, by the way, as I had earlier mentioned, is a G clade or a B.1 as per Pango. And the, the, the strain is uh, called the NIV220770 strain because it originated and was propagated in NIV and handed over to BBIL. So if you look at uh, the post uh, challenge responses, uh, prior to challenge, in the immunization phase, before challenge was done, you can see that uh, the colors here are uh, antigen and algel 1, uh, lower dose 3 micrograms and algel 2, the combo uh, adjuvant. And here you can see uh, it is 6 micrograms in purple, is 6 micrograms of uh, vaccine antigen and the combo adjuvant. And you can see with uh, all three groups, which are called group two, group three, group four, 
group one being the placebo of phosphate buffered saline, which is in blue here. With these three, you could see a rise in antibody, uh, neutralizing antibody titers. And even post challenge, there seemed to be uh, a rise in antibody titers, particularly with group three, which had three micrograms of antigen and the combo uh, adjuvant. When we looked at the IgG response, both in the immunization phase and post challenge phase, it was similar. The IG2 subtype was detected in all that uh, had uh, uh, been vaccinated as compared to the group one, which is a placebo group. And um, um, uh, the, the, uh, the immune response as per binding antibody was very good in all the three groups, namely group two, group three, and group four. We also looked at the presence of virus in nasal and throat swab, uh, uh, swabbings. And we could see that uh, significantly less virus loads in throat swab was seen in all the three vaccinated groups as compared to the uh, placebo group. And also virus clearance from throat swab by day seven in the vaccinate group was definitely seen. Uh, and um, by 10th day, um, uh, it was also noticed, 10th day being somewhere here, also noticed in group one, which is the placebo group. Uh, we also looked at uh, other parts of the uh, um, uh, uh, respiratory tract, the trachea, the nasal turbinates, and the lung, and lesser virus loads were seen in the vaccinated group, and the clearance from lungs and trachea in group three and four was seen uh, well before the close of the study, 15th day, in fact, it was seen uh, by the seventh day. Virus load in extra pulmonary organs actually could not be detected in any of these organs with the vaccinated group, but up to third day, um, we could detect the virus in the placebo group, uh, but not in any of the vaccinated uh, animals. We also looked at serum cytokine assay, TNF-alpha, IL-4, IL-10, IL-6, interferon gamma, and IL-12, but we could not see any significant differences in any of the groups. When we looked at the gross pathological findings, in window A or inset A is the placebo group and B, C and D represent groups two, uh, three and four, which are the vaccinated groups. And when we looked at the lungs um, and animals who were harvested by the seventh day, we could see that there was uh, diffuse areas of consolidation and congestion, both on gross and in sectioning. But in the flaccid, uh, in the vaccinated group, we could see that, uh, which are shown here, the lung looked mostly normal by gross appearance. When we looked at the uh, histopathological picture, this is group one, the placebo group, and this is the group two, three, and four, we could find that in group one, there was definitely a suggestion of acute inflammatory response, diffuse alveolar damage, and also a significant amount of cellular infiltration. Um, and you can see here that there was also a kind of a uh, exudate here. But in the vaccinated individuals, but for a little of congestive foci seen on the third day, the histology almost looked normal. So what were the conclusions based on our clinical trials in the Syrian hamsters? Both neutralizing antibody and binding antibodies were observed even in the immunization period. And uh, the titer were, continued to rise with the best response seen in groups three and four by day 48 prior to them getting challenged. Uh, the highest antibody, neutralizing antibody titers were seen in group three. On day three, post uh, challenge, there was low viral titers seen in the organs of vaccinated groups, uh, but there was fast viral clearance in all the vaccinated uh, groups. And uh, it appeared that the vaccine candidates prevented the Syrian hamsters from developing pneumonia, both by gross and histological appearance. And when animals were weighed over the course of the study, uh, there was less decline in body weight in the uh, immunized uh, animals, least uh, amount of uh, body weight loss uh, being in the group three, which received three micrograms of uh, virus antigen and the combo adjuvant. 
This was published in iScience. And let me go on to preclinical trials in rhesus macaques. And uh, here, uh, sorry. Uh, the schedule was a two uh, dose vaccination when compared to the golden hamsters where it was a three dose um, uh, immunization schedule. But animals were vaccinated. There were five animals in each of the four groups, five primates, and uh, they were immunized on day zero, day 14, and on the 20th day, two weeks after the second dose, they received the virus challenge internasally. And like the hamsters, the animals were um, uh, sacrificed at these time intervals, slightly different. They were followed up up to a week and clinical specimens collected from these uh, animals, uh, sacrificed animals, right up to stool specimens and other investigations such as X-ray was also done for them. So again, if you look at the IgG binding antibody in the immunization phase, uh, be it um, um, IgG antibodies, uh, whole virus antibody, RBD spe uh, specific antibody uh, and uh, uh, antibody against the nucleo uh, protein, they all showed an increase in the uh, post-vaccination phase. If we look, this is the post-challenge period, you can see an uh, uh, increase by, by the time we reached the seventh day. Likewise, for the three types of antibody ELISAs that we established here uh, in our setting. Uh, and even prior to uh, challenge, you could see there was a trend in increase in antibodies, even in these primates. When we looked at neutralizing antibody, you could also see that uh, there was a slight, in, uh, there was an increase definitely pre immunization and a slight trend in increase, uh, uh, though not. Um, um, dramatic uh, over the period of follow-up. We also compared the neutralizing antibody titers, not only to the prototype strain, the G-clade or B.1, but we also looked at two strains of the O-clade, which is a different lineage of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we could see that the, this, this antibody response had cross-protection against unrelated uh, clades. Uh, X-ray images showed that uh, three animals in the placebo group had actually some lung infiltrates and uh, evidence of bronchopneumonia and lobar pneumonia by day seven. A uh, similar uh, chest picture was seen in two of the five animals in group, groups two and four, but that resolved by the fifth day. All in all, um, the, uh, the radiological picture in immunized animals was uh, better not uh, uh, like that of the um, placebo group. And actually no radiographic abnormalities were seen in group three. We also looked at the virus load for uh, and the throat and the nasal um, swabs and uh, genomic RNA uh, was seen in group one right up to day seven. There was a significant difference observed in the virus loads of both nasal and throat swabs in the vaccinated group as compared to the placebo. Um, if, we went, if we looked at the um, uh, gross pathology, uh, here you could see that when we followed up animals by the seventh day, you could see that in the placebo group, whether you all the lobes of the lung were involved, uh, whereas uh, in the vaccinated group, the gross appearance looked normal and all other organs also showed no gross changes in the vaccinated group. When we looked at the histopathology as well as immunohistochemistry in groups one to four, we could see again that in the group one, which received phosphate buffered saline, there was not only hemorrhages and hyaline membrane formation, there was also uh, significant exudates with inflammatory cell infiltrate and also um, some regions alone um, had uh, significant exudates, as you can see here, They're shown by the black arrow, you can see in other areas. But in the, in the, uh, in the animals that were uh, immunized uh, and then challenged, most of them had a normal lung, lung parenchyma picture. When we looked at the immunohistochemistry, Again, in the group one, we could see that we could actually demonstrate virus antigen 
not only in the pneumonocytes, but in the alveolar macrophage cells in the placebo group, but not detectable in the vaccinated group. Uh, with regard to virus load in respiratory tract, be it the nasal mucosa, trachea, nasopharynx, oropharynx, tonsils, mediastinal lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes, and so on, the real detect, uh, ability to detect uh, genomic RNA was only with the group one or the placebo group. None of the vaccinated animals uh, showed virus detection in any of these respiratory um, anatomical sites. Uh, also extra pulmonary, it was, uh, we, we could see that in the placebo group, genomic RNA was seen in a variety of organs. In the vaccinated group, uh, mostly there was no virus detected in any organ, except there was one animal in group four, group four which showed some genomic RNA in the ileum and in the cecum, um, uh, which, was, which is seen here on day seven. Looking at the cytokine and the chemokine response, IL-6 was significantly elevated in the placebo group uh, as compared to the other groups. Inflammatory, anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-5 was significantly higher in group two compared to the placebo group on day one, as you can see here. And um, uh, IL-8 was found significantly higher in group uh, three on day three and day five uh, when we uh, took their samples from these primates. So the conclusion from the uh, uh, studies, preclinical studies in non-human primates was that uh, there was definitely immunogenicity of the vaccine candidates used, uh, showing demonstrable uh, neutralizing antibody and binding antibody, um, uh, both, both pre-challenge and post-challenge. IgG antibodies and neutralizing antibody definitely showed an increasing trend post-challenge with the best response being seen uh, in the group three. Serum of vaccinated uh, animals neutralized SARS-CoV-2 um, of other clades. Remember I mentioned the O clade, unrelated clade. And the clinical and radiological indications of uh, virus load, interstitial pneumonia, detection of virus antigen by immunohistochemistry in lung, strengthen the evidence of SARS-CoV-2 induced pulmonary disease in unprotected placebo animals. And clearance of genomic RNA was seen in all these sites uh, by even the seventh day. And there was absence of pathological lung lesions in those animals that had received vaccine. Among the candidates, again, it was the group three that demonstrated the best response. So the, uh, this also was published, our studies with the non-human primates was published in uh, Nature Communications. We've gone on to, um, this was a study uh, primarily uh, mooted by the BBIL group, demonstrating that this vaccine formulation that has algel 2, which is a combo adjuvant, gives a TH1 skewed immune response uh, uh, against this whole video on inactivated vaccine formulation. We also have publications in Lancet Infectious Diseases for phase one, phase two clinical trials. And phase three, which has just come out, is also going to be uh, published in Lancet, showing that the overall vaccine efficacy for this whole video on inactivated vaccine is 77.8%. Protection against severe symptomatic COVID-19 is 93.4%. Efficacy against asymptomatic infection is lower, obviously, because uh, uh, people can pick up the infection and carry it in their nares. And efficacy against Delta was to the tune of about 65. Now we move to the role of uh, how we have interrogated the immune response against Covaxin and against the recently emerged uh, variants, particularly the variants of concern and some variants of interest. So uh, I, I had mentioned that the earliest clades, our first clades that we detected as per Gisaid classification were S and L, but that was quickly replaced by the G clade. And these are all like right from here, you can see the blue, um, the blue depicting the advent of the G clade and related clades of G, uh, which all had the signature mutation of D614G uh, mutation, which is aspartic acid to glycine. 
Um, and you can see that over the bulk of 2020, it was these different uh, G clades and subclades of G uh, that dominated uh, not only India, uh, but um, the world. But this is Indian um, uh, data, but also globally, it was these clades that dominated. But in February 2021, we had the advent of a new strain that had certain signature mutations, and that emanated actually from Maharashtra, and it was called the B.1.617. And that again split into three lineages, namely the B.1.617.1, the B.1.617.2, otherwise popularly, popularly known as the Delta variant, and the B.1.617.3 circulated for a very short time and is really of a very negligible amount today. And what you're seeing here is the domination of the Delta variant, the B.1.617.2. Don't be uh, mistaken. This is uh, GISA data, which is uh, yet to accrue. So it's not like Delta is going away. It's just that the numbers here are less. So the uh, curve seems to be dipping, but actually Delta variant is ruling the roost, both in India and globally, uh, detectable in more than 148 countries and more as we speak. So as these, uh, the, uh, the, the knowledge of these new variants being, uh, 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 you know, detected in different parts of the world. One of the first was the alpha variant or the B.1.7 uh, variant, which was detected actually in the UK. And we were quick to characterize this strain. We were able to grow it. We were able to sequence it. And the, in fact, in another publication in infection, we were able to bring out the first uh, strains in India that belong to the alpha variant. And I will show you uh, our studies of vaccines against this variant. In February, we were able to pick up, um, actually uh, early February, uh, a, a relative of the gamma variant. So it is otherwise known as a P2. P2 or is a relative of P1. P1 being the gamma variant that came out of Brazil. We had just two cases of the P2 variant. It hasn't circulated in India after that. Then we were able to get strains by following up um, international travelers and contacts of international travelers. This is the beta variant, uh, B.1.351, that emanated out of South Africa. And we were able to then isolate uh, the Delta variant, uh, the Kappa, which is the B.1.617.1, and even subsequent uh, sublineages of the Delta AY.1. So uh, today in our custody, we have uh, at NIV uh, Pune, we have over 200 different SARS-CoV strains in our repository. And we have been able to interrogate these against antibody of vaccines of Covaxin, and have not only been able to interrogate them, but have managed to publish it. So the first was the alpha variant, and this is the prototype strain. And we, we got people who got, were vaccinated with Covaxin, and we did the PRNT uh, titers uh, of uh, those who had been vaccinated for Covaxin against the prototype strain, against another unrelated strain, an O-clade, and against the alpha variant. And one look at it, you can see that there's no, uh, if you look at the median titers, there was no statistically significant difference. We went on to uh, look at the um, newly emerging strain that came out in February of 2021 from Maharashtra. And we again compared this, uh, the B.1.617 against the prototype strain, the B.1, and against the, um, the alpha variant or the alpha VOC. And we could see that there was some dip in the antibody binding. And when we did against uh, paired human samples, we could see that there was a diminution in antibody um, uh, titers, uh, a dip of about 1.95 log. Uh, when we looked at vaccinees and those who had had natural infection, there was no significant difference uh, of titers for this particular uh, strain, the B.1.617. 
we went on to look at uh, two of the uh, more uh, sinister uh, uh, variants of interest. And I'm just showing you here, this is the spike uh, uh, gene. And it's in the spike gene where we see the individual amino acid mutations that are typical of these variants of uh, concern. And when we looked at individuals uh, who were both, uh, who had a natural infection and those who are vaccinated uh, for Covaxin, and this is the prototype strain. This is the beta variant. This is the delta variant. Likewise, this is the prototype strain, the beta variant and the delta variant. We found particularly for those who were vaccinated, there was almost a 3.3 log diminution in uh, PRNT titers against the beta variant and a 2.7 fold diminution uh, of antibody binding and titers against the delta variant. We also, um, I, I, you remember I mentioned a relative of the, uh, the gamma variant. We had just two strains and at that time we did not know the significance. So we could quick to isolate and also look at the um, difference in titers in those who were naturally infected and who had vaccine. And we found here there was a diminution of about 1.92 log in the uh, uh, median antibody titers of uh, individuals who had been vaccinated for coaxin and against this strain, which is known as the P2 or the Zeta variant. The Zeta variant is neither a VOC nor a variant of interest, but uh, it was a strain we had picked up uh, in March, uh, early uh, this year. So we had immediately characterized it. So this is the team that has not only helped with the isolation, uh, uh, but the vaccine work, uh, this comprised of the team at the biosafety level four. Those who um, the, uh, the leader of this team is Dr. Pragya Yadav and her team here. The leader of the team that did all the laborious PRNT studies is Dr. Gajanan Saptal. He was assisted by Dr. Gururaj and team. Those who looked at immunological assays, veterinary scientists who helped with the animal studies, and we also borrowed help from clinicians and surgeons from the armed forces because it needed bronchoscopy and elaborate animal experiments um, uh, to harvest organs. Uh, so we borrowed talent and skill from uh, um, a group of surgeons from the armed forces and from ICMR. And that we, we sincerely are, uh, thank the Director General of ICMR the head of uh, uh, the ECD, then the new head, Dr. Samiran Panda, and Dr. Nivedita Gupta, um, a virology ch um, unit chief from ICMR headquarters, who rendered a lot of support during these vaccine trials. Uh, I was lucky to welcome uh, Prime Minister Modi when he came to Pune late last year. So I was uh, given the uh, the extreme honor to welcome him on the helipad as his chopper touched ground. And this was indeed a big uh, um, recognition of what ICMR NIV has done over this pandemic. So you might worry about uh, what is going to happen with these variants. Where are we going with these variants? And uh, you, you might have heard that in response to the very first VOC, the alpha variant that came out of UK, the, um, the government immediately and the Ministry of Health, as well as the Department of Biotechnology and ICMR got together and formed a consortium of 10 laboratories that uh, became regional uh, genome uh, sequencing, whole genome sequencing laboratories representing different geographic areas, ICMR NIV included in this first 10 group of laboratories. But you know that our active whole genome sequencing is laborious. And given the complexity and size of our nation, we have expanded this uh, consortium to include 18 more laboratories. So we are 28 such regional sequencing, um, whole genome sequencing laboratories. And at, as we speak, we are recruiting more other, more laboratories of, um, from uh, important institutes and medical colleges so that yeah, we might probably expand to even 50 or more different laboratories that will be able to handle the load of whole genome sequencing in real time. So with this, 
let me thank you for your patient listening and i i i am really thankful for having me on this webinar series and um, i thank all my colleagues uh, who have been uh, here to um, support me during this uh, 19 odd months while this pandemic is raged thank you for your patient listening thank you uh, professor priya uh, i think it was really wonderful to have you and uh, thanks for your very detailed and informative talk uh, for all of us so before i hand over the session to dr upasna for the question answer uh, from the audience and also from our side uh, i have couple of questions uh, like uh, i mean when uh, you took charge of nib it was just uh, november 2019 and uh, within two months you had to face this enormous challenge uh what exactly was going on in your mind and heart uh, what did you anticipate at the time and now when you look back after 18 months uh how do you feel about uh, all this uh, successful journey in last 18 months that is one second uh, as you know i think you might be uh, hearing this question again and again from all corners uh because nowadays uh, there is a talk about the booster dose so there is a very common question in the in the people's mind that Uh, how long these vaccines are going to be effective is it something going to be a kind of annual booster dose like flu vaccine and all that so these are two two of my questions thank you for uh, asking me those questions and uh, coming to the first question uh, there are two takeaways from my experience the first was uh, it was um, prudent that we had a preparedness so when we started hearing about these novel pneumonia cases in china i got together with the physician scientists in this group i'm a medical scientist too and we were kind of studying the you know the uh, clinical um, uh, presentation of these this unusual um, pneumonia and we 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 formed ourselves into teams uh, into a team that included both laboratory scientists and physician scientists and we started having actually dry runs using uh, pan corona virus primers that the national uh, influenza center here in nib had we did not have specific primers then so we start we had pan corona virus it was known it is a corona virus so we started doing some dry runs and it was i would say preparedness that helped us uh, actually detect the case very early in the course of the pandemic we were one of among the first few nations to detect it and almost as soon as the first cases got into the country that was in the early part of the pandemic looking back if we have if we have achieved what we have achieved and have not really been able to uh, give you the whole spectrum in this presentation it is purely teamwork i think teamwork is what will help us to get anywhere even we are called to face such challenges and that's the clear message i want to give everybody we success can be only achieved through teamwork coming to your second question with regard to boosters yes this may require boosting at some point in time our immune response we know definitely there's a very good immune response uh, following vaccine till 6 months and there's data coming out at 8 and 9 months for other vaccines and we do believe there will be a good immune response for the initial few months and i think there will come a time when we will have to think of boosters uh, there is no international recommendation thus far though some countries are beginning to boost their uh, uh, the healthcare personnel and the personnel and others who are at risk but in india there's no recommendation so far and who will obviously take a position uh, because there is huge vaccine inequity in our um, uh, world today uh, in the developing nations and in uh, countries in africa and other parts of the world that just a maximum 2% of the population is vaccinated and in the context of that if they give a strong um, you know recommendation for taking a booster now that would cause uh, you know tremendous problems because if you remember in the words of the secretary uh, sorry the director general of who he actually said um no one is protected unless everybody is protected so we need to actually make sure that vaccine drive is really on not 
fourth gear, but on seventh gear as much as possible so that all nations are able to vaccinate as quickly as possible. Thank you, Professor Priya. So now I request Upasana to take over the session further. Thank you, Chandra. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for uh, that in-depth information about development of co-vaccine. As a virologist myself, I have enjoyed listening to you today and learned so much. So thank you. Uh, and many congratulations for all your efforts and achievements in this pandemic. Uh, and you rightly said it's a teamwork, so that's really important for us to understand that teamwork is important. Uh, so uh, we have received many questions from our live audience, and uh, what I'll do is I'll try to address uh, as many as possible. But before we start with audience questions, I will uh, ask a couple of uh, questions from Inyasa's side. Uh, so the first question is, uh, no, is the existing co-vaccine type, that is uh, the virus type used for inactivation, sufficient to handle the mutated versions or next generation candidates are also under development? So I'm really happy you asked that question because I was going at breakneck speed to try and honor the time given to me. Actually, you'd be very happy to know we have handed over the variants that we have grown in our facility to BBI. And each of them is via uh, uh, agreement, a formal agreement. So we have handed over. So they will probably, they will definitely be incorporating it in the, uh, the the versions of the vaccine they are continuing to make up. And that is a really good question. So uh, doco vaccine and a whole virion inactivated vaccine is an old fashioned approach and a labor intensive approach. Uh, the manufacturers, along with the help of ICMR and IV, are trying to make it contemporary. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next question is, uh, we heard that, uh, if it's then the news already, that trials on children are being carried out. And uh, we are listening, we are anticipating third wave where uh, it's supposed to hit children more. Uh, so, uh, although it won't prevent the children this time, but um, should we expect the availability of vaccine for children very soon? We should, and definitely, as you, you would have heard about uh, um, uh, Zydus Cadilla having got approval, and maybe by October, they will be able to issue doses. And uh, Bharat Biotech also would be completing their studies by end of September, and they will have to take it to the regulatory authorities. I think this fear of the third wave on ch affecting children, uh, the jury is out because uh, it's only uh, a, a minority of children that really develop very serious complications. That is true, but majority of them handle it quite well. In fact, most of the time children have asymptomatic infection. So remember what will invite the third wave is our behavior. If we forget about our masks, if we forget about COVID appropriate behavior, we are inviting the third wave just by our behavior. I would like to quote the director general of WHO again to say, and he actually said, the pandemic and people keep asking, when will this pandemic end? And he has wonderfully um, you know, uh, summarized it in saying, the pandemic will end when the world chooses to end it, it is in our hands. So, you know, this third wave is not something that, you know, some superpower, supernatural power is going to send to us. We dictate when the third wave comes. And you and me have the responsibility of keeping that third wave away as long as possible and making sure that the size of that wave is, uh, you know, smaller, and not, uh, you know, sort of overwhelming the medical uh, facilities as the second wave did. Thank you. Uh, so we have less time now and we have uh, surprisingly many questions coming from the audience. So what I'll do is I'll hand over the session to uh, uh, Dr. Nishan Chakravarti and he will take up rest of the questions before we conclude. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And uh, thank you, Professor uh, Priya, for your extraordinarily wonderful talk. Um, and as you can see, there are so many questions already 
with us. Uh, I would like like to take a few of them. Uh, and first is in the context of there are some recent reports suggesting uh, that ICMR has uh, sorry the DCGI has okayed the vaccine mixing study. Is that correct? Uh, Covaxin and Covishield. Uh well, actually, that was based, the, they, uh, that came out of a serendipitous situation where you may, be, may, may have heard that in the state of Uttar Pradesh, it, you know, the doses got, you know, sort of swapped. So you actually had a mixture or a heterogeneous mix uh, or mix and match, as people call, but it was unintended, but it happened. So we have actually looked at it and we have found that uh, there was uh, uh, um, actually uh, no harm, no adverse uh, event and actually slight benefit from mixing the vaccines. But that again, that was done on a very small, modest set of um, individuals. ICMR will be undertaking larger studies and then that will come as a clear recommendation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh Another question, uh, since Gyantika is essentially for everyone, uh, so all people, not only to the scientific community. So one question that comes to the mind of every person is, why do we need to take two doses at least uh, for a vaccine? Uh, spe and especially in this context of COVID-19 as well. So if you could clarify that for our audience. So two doses, you know, actually that second dose serves a kind of booster to the first dose. And uh, particularly if you take Covaxin and other inactivated vaccines, they always use multiple doses. If you look at some pediatric formulations uh, like rubella um, vaccination, earlier we used to just give, uh, you know, as part of MMR, just one dose. But now we have understood even with the live attenuated vaccine, we are giving a booster dose at um, uh, measles, measles, rubella, for instance, we give it at uh, a few months later at 15 months. So uh, always giving a second dose actually serves as a booster itself for the first dose. It primes the immune system. You have that, uh, you know, the memory cells and uh, um, T cell, uh, T and B memory cells are provoked to, you know, uh, replicate and uh, they, they, it leaves you with a better level of immunity. Yeah, well, rightly said, ma'am. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, another question uh, is a very... Sorry, Nishant. I think we... Uh, I'm not able to hear anything. I think he's frozen. Yes, yes, Dr. Chakrabarty. I, I missed your question because... Yes, yes. So this question was actually a very general question. Uh, we could see the enormous amount of work that has gone in for the development of Covaxin. So what kind of difficulties did you face uh, when you were conducting the animal studies, if you would uh, like to tell us? Uh, first, it drew on, uh, you know, enormous skill from, skill from our veterinary scientists which were not, who were not geared to do these kind of studies, particularly uh, primate experiments. So as, as I, sh in my acknowledgement, first acknowledgement slide, you may have seen me acknowledge even surgeons who we had roped in from the armed forces. So we needed skill. We needed to acquire equipment really fast. Time was of the essence. Uh, so, you know, uh, we were like, literally we were fight, raging, uh, fighting a war. And also to get the equipment to be needed enough personnel, you know, to work in a BSL-4 facility, you need to have sufficient trained people. You're wearing those positive pressure suits and doing the most uh, dangerous kind of work, so to say. So, uh, you know, skilled personnel was a challenge. And of course, keeping up the morale of them and to stay uninfected. I'm proud to say we did not have any uh, laboratory associated infection throughout this pandemic. I'm really happy to say that. That's that's really wonderful. Um, and definitely because of the stringent uh, protocols that have been followed, I'm sure. Uh, I think uh, we have another interesting question, which is more of a scientific question. Uh, and it goes as that 
Covaxin, as you mentioned, is an inactivated whole virion vaccine. So that can stimulate both the Th1 and Th2 responses uh, and can produce antibodies by plasma cells uh, and also the CD8 positive uh, T lymphocytes. But so what is the quality of this uh, CTL uh, in the whole body that you see? Actually, and the CTL the response quantity, is... Yeah. Sorry, the CTL response is quite good, almost comparable with the um, CD4 um, uh, T helper cells. Uh, and uh, we, as you can see, one of the publications was uh, uh, bringing out the fact that it is TH1 skewed immune response because, you know, we were always worried about ADE, which, you know, where, where you always worry when you're making vaccines, everybody knows about dengue virus and the antibody dependent enhancement. So we wanted to not just boost the humoral immunity or antibody based immunity, but also give it a TH1 skewing. So uh, uh, the, uh, our uh, cell mediated immune uh, immunity based assays were not so elaborate. Uh, that was also an area where we could have done much more, uh, but I'm, looking back, we could have done much more, but at that time, uh, we should have done more elaborate studies with the TH, uh, with the cell mediated immunity. But whatever we did clearly showed that the cell mediated immune response was very, very good. Okay, that's that's wonderful. And we definitely can imagine. So uh, sitting right now, and uh, probably it's very convenient to forget the circumstances uh, in which this entire exercise was conducted. So hats off to all of you. Uh, would you be like, you know, able to uh, tell us about the quantity of the CD8 plus T cells uh, in the body after the vaccination. Any comments on that? Uh, actually, I don't have data on that. We are just doing some of those uh, studies now. So I don't have data to tell you on that. No. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Uh, and another question which probably hovers everybody's mind is how long will the vaccine be effective? So, so I, as I had mentioned earlier, we know definitely six months and there are studies with other vaccines showing eight months and beyond. Um, uh, and as I had mentioned, eventually we may need to boost it. And as Dr. Sharma had mentioned, uh, will it become like a flu vaccine kind of boosting? Probably will, because I think this infection will eventually become more, you know, with time. Maybe after 2022, it might take a more endemic kind of slant. And we, 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 boost, we give vaccination for influenza, particularly healthcare workers and those that are at risk. We may reach a situation where, who knows, we might have an influenza and SARS-CoV-2 combo vaccine. And I know people are working on that as well. And that might become the, the norm in the future. All right. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and. Uh... I'm sure there are lots of questions still in the minds of the audience, uh, but due to the time constraints, we will have to restrict it uh, here. So thank you once again for taking time out from your busy schedule and agreeing to thank be one of, our, one of our speakers. I'm sure our audience have enjoyed a lot listening to you. And this session will also be available on Inyas's YouTube channel for those who want to watch it later. So with this, thank you once again. And thanks to the entire Gantika team. Inyas will come back next uh, with the next talk of Gantika soon. Till then, stay safe and stay healthy. And Jai Hind. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am.